Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Catherine Gamble. Um, I am the uh, mental health nurse and uh, just recently announced uh, Royal College of Nursing Fellow. The RCN is the largest membership organisation, uh, but it's great uh, that so many people have joined this evening from actually what we understand to be all over the world. Hosted by the RCN Library, which is the largest nursing library in the world, um, we are delighted to be um, here this evening. Many of you will be familiar with Zoom, but we just needed to make sure I have the unenviable task of going through what actually is the, um, what if I was doing it live, I would be showing you where the exits were and where the conveniences were. But in fact, what I'm going to just take you through is some ideas around how to manage Zoom. Um, that during your during this event you will be muted and your videos will be um, off. If you're having trouble, just click out and return in and out, and hopefully it will um, uh, come back and you'll be able to rejoin us. We have um, British Sign Languages interpreters, and we uh, will be they'll be coming in and out. They will be constantly on our um, screen so that hopefully you will be able to see everything that was discussed and be able to understand and see them. So you will see Jackie now and you will meet Eska in a little while um, when they swap over. Uh, the captions that you will see are automatically generated and if you prefer not to see the captions you can turn them off by clicking on the three dots in the corner and then hide subtitles. I'm pretending I know how that works. I am, however, um, just keen that people do know that they can use the chat box. And we're also on social media this evening and we're using the hashtag um, uh, for, for this event, uh, which we have, um, uh, we've got, and you'll, you'll, you'll see it through the RCN Libraries announcement. So here we are. Becoming an RCN Fellow recently provided me uh, with a unique opportunity to raise mental health nurses profile and initiate a much needed conversations into how mental health services treat black people and actually co-produce this event. The mental health nurses form the largest, most diverse professional group in the mental health workforce. Yet to address concerns that black men are four times more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act than their white counterparts, this wealth of cultural expertise is rarely tapped into. Black nurses are less represented at senior levels, have measurably worse day-to-day -day experiences of life in the NHS organisations and have many more obstacles to progress in their careers. They, like those with lived experience and of mental, serious mental illness, rarely get the platform to be the drivers of change agents or share their narratives at national level. So here we are. This is it. We are at national level. And thanks to award-winning actor and now author, David Harewood, his BBC documentary, Psychosis and Me, and his book, Maybe I Don't Belong Here, which actually is one of the hashtags we are using tonight, about his recovery from psycho psychotic breakdown as a young man to his 20s to Hollywood stardom. Wow, we don't hear many of those and it's wonderful that we do. Since the publication, David has shared his experiences at numerous events and on TV and radio, reaching a really wide audience. And last night, his exploration of his family tree and personal history was very powerful and really um, brought home just how much we are um, as a thousand years of slavery was extraordinarily insightful and heart rendering. A driving force for systematic and cultural change David has become without unwittingly, without realising it, despite being incredibly busy rehearsing for a new play, we are delighted David has been able to join us. Um, it sounds he's also been able to, since the book launch, also managed to get a mental health resource, which I hope we'll get to hear something about. Over the next 50 minutes or so, David will read extracts from the book and in conversation with Darcy Fellow, Simon Arde, registered mental health nurse, mental health network manager at King's College at the hospital and at RCN's expert representative for Parity of Steam and Kojo Bonzu, the peer involvement worker 
I just wanted to say that Stephen Jones will then come on at the end to um, thank everybody on behalf of the RCN. So back now um, online, um, I, uh, there is a considerable amount of work to be involved uh, in addressing the inequalities of mental health services. And ho we're hoping that this vital event will stimulate a much needed conversation. So it's over to you, Simon, David and Kojo. Welcome so much. Hello. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you very much, Kat. Thank you for, for that introduction. And, and I'd like to welcome everybody again and to welcome uh, both David and, and Kojo and, and to say how kind of excited and, and privileged when, when I found out we were doing this, I tweeted that how excited and privileged I felt to be sharing this space with, with the two of you. So thank you for, for this evening. Um, as, as Catherine highlighted, so one of the things that we wanted to, to think about um, over the, the course of this conversation this evening is to, to, to have an opportunity to recognise some of the challenges that persist, um, the challenges that, that David has, has spoken about and, and how they, they still manifest sort of 30 years later. Um, and to experience kind of different forms of recovery and, and to celebrate that, which is something that we don't always get an opportunity to do. And then to think in a sort of co-productive space, how can we change this for the future? How can we change this for, for, for future generations? And it's important, I think, for us to, to recognize that in, in this conversation there exists or, or there, there is a journey that's been taken. And we're going to try and take our own sort of little journey throughout the evening tonight. And so I thought a good place to, to start or a helpful place to start to try and contextualise that would be to, to invite David to, to offer us a, a reading about, I guess, um, how he's come to sort of understand some of the trauma he experienced and, and how he started on this journey. Well, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, and can I say how delighted I am to be here? It's very, very exciting to be talking to so many uh, mental health practitioners who have really engaged with the subject of my book. I, you know, I thought it kind of thought I was writing this in isolation, um, but it seems as though it's really. Um, throwing a grenade into a, a subject which um, really uh, has, has needed um, urgently discussing. Uh, you know, we've all we're 18 months into this pandemic and I think what, what it's shown is that there are, uh, what it's revealed is the many inequalities that there are uh, in, in our system. And I'm just delighted that um, in trying to, what's that word, build back better. Uh, you know, we are trying to address uh, these concerns in a fresh and, um, and, and productive way. Um, I, I'm, I feel honored to be a part of this group. I think it's a really, really important and vital uh, uh, service that we're, we're all um, uh, in, uh, engaged in. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, as I said, my, my experiences were 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, I, I, the, the book I finished, the book I finished at the start of, I finished, I think I finished writing my book in January. And um, the thing about, you know, I, I, well, what I find about psychosis is that it sometimes still has the ability to open me up and uh, really sort of shock me and produce uh, emotions that I've, felt was sort of long, long gone. You know, you, one, would, one would think that after 30 years, I would be sort of used to it, but I've been so surprised to find myself emotional talking about psychosis because it's trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, trauma has an ability to rise up and uh, um, kick you in the face. Uh, so even though I, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I've talked about this um, on shows, TV shows, radio shows. I've done a whole range of um, talks and uh, public appearances. 
I'll, I'll be honest, it's been exhausting and um, uh, mentally draining. But seeing so many people here tonight and seeing the engagement that writing that book, writing this book has, has um uh has created I, I, i'm sort of filled with energy so so you know, forgive me if i do sort of stumble um but i i'm really delighted to be here i thought i'd just read if i could simon just a, 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 a brief section of my book which sort of sort of for me encapsulates um uh, why I, why i wrote it and sort of encapsul encapsulates uh an idea of where I was and where I am. Uh, and this is right at the start of my book. And it says, um, my breakdown was a cry for help that I couldn't really appreciate at the time. Uncovering its origins while writing this book has been difficult. But what I have discovered has given me immense freedom. Now it's possible to consider my entire life from a whole new perspective. In moving through post-traumatic stress, I have discovered some post-traumatic growth. I'm grateful for the opportunity to understand the roots of my insecurities and vulnerability. And I have written this book as an attempt to help other people connect mental health to something beyond themselves. I was extremely lucky to survive my brush with psychosis. And although I was sectioned twice in short succession, I have never had further episodes, nor needed further medication. That's not true for everyone. There are many black men in particular who continue to be affected by these issues, but avoid getting the support they need because of traumatic experiences with mental health services. Other chronic sufferers find themselves trapped in a cycle of hospitalization, poverty, and sometimes crime. This can be an impossible pattern to break. And when racism is thrown into the mix, the emotional buildup can have explosive and sometimes dangerous consequences. As a black British man, I believe it's vital that I tell this story. It may just be a single account from one person of color, but my hope is that it might be enough to change some opinions or more importantly, stop someone else from spinning completely out of control. That's, uh, that's the beginning of my book. I find myself sort of welling up as I read it. As I said, this thing can be sometimes quite emotional, but um, the fact that I have come through this and uh, continue to have a career and continue to uh, have succeeded, uh, that's the post-traumatic growth. Um, but I'm even more thrilled and a bit emotional, um, thrilled and happy that this has found such a wide audience of support and that I, uh, I feel really privileged to be engaged with so many professionals about such a really important subject, which as I'm sure Kojo can attest to, is still happening today. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, I'm just, just delighted to be sharing a panel with you all. Thank you for that, David. And as, as, as you say, um, there are aspects of this that continue to, to happen to this very day. And, and I know, Kojo, when we were speaking a bit about um, kind of your experience and, and kind of how you had kind of experienced the, the mental health system, you, you offered some kind of thoughts and reflection. I, I don't know if you wanted to sort of take a couple of moments to talk a bit about that particularly as you, you spoke about the, the experience of sort of coming into services. Yeah. Um, yeah, I experienced a lot of difficulty and I'm sure that a lot of it was down to stereotype mm. and profiling 
due to my color, due to my size. Um, I made many attempts at a time of need um, where I had realized that I needed help. Um, and uh, when I made attempts to try to gain informal access, I was met with a lot of red tape. So I made a number of attempts, more than eight attempts uh, across three different hospitals. And I actually ended up being um, charged with offenses and of disturbing the peace, uh, public disorder, basically treated like a criminal for someone who was just trying to seek help. And ironically, um, I ended up going to prison and being in prison, they treated me more like a mental health patient and referred me to the right services that I needed. And naturally um, that was warming to me, but it was also concerning to me that this, the community mental health team had treated me in that way. And the only explanation I can look at is racism and stereotypes and stigma. Mm. So um, I spent a number of years out of my life in mental health at a very higher secure unit, whereby if, I, if my cry for help was received with empathy or compassion, it could have just been a few days or a few weeks. So I can relate to what David um, has gone through. And um, I can say that a lot of the elements of what he experienced is still alive today and it needs to change. But um, luckily I was able to change the narrative. I came across the involvement team and the involvement register and during my time in hospital, I began to participate in co-production, um, co-production projects such as the BME Burdett project with Catherine Gamble mm -hmm. and Christian. And that was a turning point for me, whereby everything became more solution orientated and mm -hmm. looking towards the future and what solutions we can come to. So it's, it's a blessing to be on this platform where we can collectively discuss and reason and try and find some way around this because racism is a big elephant in the room and it can be intimidating when it's you against so many professionals, you know, you against a doctor, psychiatrist, nurses, security, police, it goes on and on. It's it's just a spider web, and I'm just trying to detangle from it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Coach. And I think it's really poignant that you speak about how being in this space, we can now start to think about solutions, and we can think about how we move forward from this. And and I think there's there's something inherent in in being able to to kind of understand what's happened beforehand in order to be able to to grow from it. And, and to kind of look for those solutions. And then that was one of the things that um, I, I was particularly struck by um, in, in listening to you speak, David, in terms of this concept of, of post-traumatic growth, because within mental health services, we, we, we talk about um, working with recover, recovery or with a recovery, recovery orientated model. And that's not just about um, the kind of reduction of, of, of symptoms or kind of things like that it's, for me and, and for a lot of mental health nurses it's about kind of recognizing who's the person in front of us what strengths do they bring and what can how can we support this person to to, to kind of be the the best version of themselves in spite of of everything that's happened to them and I think that kind of concept of post-traumatic growth spoke to me when, when when I heard you speaking about it and it and it um yeah, it made complete sense because uh, to me, that's what we're talking about. So I'm, I'm quite interested in, in um, as a question to you, kind of where did that concept come from or how, or how did you arrive at that kind of, that phrase or that concept? Uh, well, it was first uh, mentioned to me by the, um, uh, the head of the uh, Mental Health Foundation mm. um, when I, 
they first started talking about psychoses in, in the in the days just after my documentary went out um you know he, he was explaining to me that that um you know i was saying how vulnerable i felt you know be, 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 because it's uh, uh you, you know as an actor you know people sort of tend to kind of give you a little some distance give you a little bit of that respect but um after the documentary people were just approaching me mm -hmm. out bare strangers just coming up to me and saying thank you so much for making that documentary you know complete strangers crossing the street to shake my hand just to tell me about their mom that had a breakdown or tell me about their fathers who'd had a breakdown or uh uncles who'd who'd uh, who, who'd passed away um uh, after taking mental health medication, I was just overwhelmed by the amount of people that that sort of celebrity uh, celebrity barrier that I had was was gone. Uh, they they were um, they just felt the need to just come up and talk to me. And um, Mark, the head, was, was was saying to saying to me that you know you we are like you like you, it's, you you're a, you're a pioneer. He said you know in in, in the in the in the you know, and those old movies, you know, those pioneers are hacking their way through the, the, under, the, the undergrowth, you know, and, and he said, that's you, you're out there in these untrodden paths, you're hacking away at these huge bushes and, and, and kind of cutting a path. And I thought to myself, that's right, I like the idea of that, that, you know, but no one's been there before. So I sort of started to relax and think, okay, I'm doing something new, something fresh. And it's got to the point now where, and I would, I, I would say nearly every single time I was approached, I burst into tears mm. uh, because it was just too overwhelming. You know, they would tell me of their mums or their dads as I say, and it was, it was really emotional. And many times I was just standing on the street, just, just crying, crying my eyes out with complete strangers, uh, you know, because, because, you know, we've both been there, you know, they experienced it and, and you know, and, 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 you know, I knew, and I, knew what it was like but now I'm at a point where I can engage those people and not not always burst into tears mm. I could sort of offer them advice I can sit and talk to them and uh, you know and I, I, I can give them you know give them advice and that sh shows to me that I'm no longer necessarily in that vulnerable place mm -hmm. that, that I can I'm much stronger now even though as I said it still has the ability to upset um I, i'm in a much better robust place that i can engage people and uh and and talk and appear on places like this and uh and and you know talk talk about it on, on the radio and you know, tel television uh, and know that it's it, it's it's for the good and that it's helping people and you know, the, the number of people who have approached me to say just thank you for speaking out. You know, you have no idea what what you what you're doing. A large black man like yourself, successful, you know, speaking out about this subject, being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I think um, I'm I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that that because you know what it's like. You know, we're, we're all supposed to be big, strong black men. We don't cry. We don't. You know, we're all tough and cool. And and I'm I, I'm to not say breaking that model, but I'm just saying, yeah, but you know, we're fathers, we're, we're also you know, brothers, we're vulnerable, we're, we're human and um, we're not superhuman. Uh, so, so I'm just, I'm just glad that I've given people uh, a, a, a look at a vulnerable, uh, a vulnerable black man uh, and um, uh, slightly change the dynamic that, that, you know, we're all, we're all these kind of super predators or, 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 or um, you know, aggressive or, or, or um, uh, dangerous. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, just giving people another look at that, and and um, that's where I think my post-traumatic growth has taken. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, I'm taken aback by what, what you say because it's it's yeah, 
growing up as a, as a, as a black male, there are certain archetypes, there are certain kind of tropes that are, are kind of put on you. And actually, to some degree, um, that being black in Britain has an impact. It has, um, it, it, it can make a difference to, to your experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, and I think it's something that you've spoken about how um, kind of being black in Britain, how that contributed to, to, to some of the, the kind of difficulties that you experience. And I think it's, it's interesting as well that you talk about this kind of multifaceted, multi-layered and, and showing people something different. And, and, and I think what I like about that is firstly that you were able to, to speak the unspoken. Um, as much over the last years, uh, a few years, that kind of mental health and mental illness has, has entered a bit more of the public consciousness, there are still conditions that aren't spoken about. Psychosis being very close to the, to the top of that list. And actually being able to... Um, to bring that to, to so many and to, to do so in such a, I guess, an articulate way that allowed people to identify with it. I think that was a, a real strength. And, and I wonder if you made this, you mentioned that kind of being an actor, people kind of, you sometimes have that a bit of a, a divide, but I wonder if there is something about kind of your, 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 your training, your expertise, who you are as, as an actor that enabled you to kind of connect with people on that level and, and connect in, in a way that maybe no one else could have at the time? I think that's undoubtedly true. Um, but again, I think through through writing the book, I, I've understood, I, I, I do think psychosis, psychosis, I, I write it in my book how it, it, it may it may change you, it, you know, it, it, it may change how you view the world, uh, it may change your perspective, and I think perhaps unbeknownst to me, you know, I, I, I write in the book how um, it's shaken the bullshit from me. I, I, that's, what I, what I, that's how I describe it. And I think part of the, my success as an actor it has been, you know, I, I know what it's like to kind of cross that line. I know what it's like to, you know, you know, how, how, you know, you know when you're sectioned, you know, it's 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 such a a mind blowing experience, and um, you know, losing your losing your mind is is losing control is such a mind blowing experience that having been there, you know, this is all this is this is nothing to you know going up on stage is nothing to me, uh, you know, uh, you know I I I I see the professional side of my life now as it's it's. Um, there's no fear attached to, to, to that professional side of me. So I, I, I guess, you know, I, I don't really have a lot of shame. And I know that's one of, one of the, 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 the big things that, that seems to prevent people from, and there's a lot of stigma attached to psychoses, particularly psychoses. I think, you know, people talk about anxiety and depression, uh, even bipolar, I think, is in Homeland, you know the lead character made bipolar sexy, um, but but psychosis has re remains this sort of this you know the big scary the big scary one that no one wants to sort of talk about. Yet it is exceedingly common, and uh, I think once I understood how common it was, and uh, when I did when I did my documentary in 2017 and met all those wonderful young people who uh, had. Uh, or experienced psychosis, I suddenly realised, you, you know, that I, you know, this this isn't the end of your life. This isn't, you know, the, here are some fantastically articulate people, all in recovery, who um, who've all had experience of psychosis, playing together and talking together at that early intervention centre. It really gave me a different look at. Um, because when I, I, I recovered in isolation 30 years ago, I was just on my own. So I didn't know you could sort of go to an early intervention center and recover with others, other people. And once I'd seen, once I saw that there was, you know, like a whole room full of um, 
young people who had all experienced something similar to me, it, it became less of a sort of a, 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 a shameful thing for me. I was like, this has happened to lots of people. And these people need representing, you know, because we're not crazy, we're not deluded, we're not, we're not frightened, we're not, we're not scary people, you know, we are, uh, this is something, this is a condition that's, uh, that, that's gripped us, taken us, uh, and that, that we can recover from. And um, I, I really didn't see the need for, sh for shame. So, um, uh, you know, I've been, I, I, I'm sort of proud uh, to, 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 to say that I'm not so proud, but I, I, I'm not afraid to say I've had a psychotic break. It's, it, it, you know, and the, the number of young people who have come up to me and said, thank you so much, because now that people saw your documentary, they don't treat me like I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they understand what I've just been through now. And um, again, that fills me with pride that, you know, that I've explained something which has previously been taboo, previously been uh, 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 a taboo subject, difficult subject. The, the other week I was in, I was in my local supermarket and um, uh, I'm doing my shopping and it's really old, an old, a uh, black lady, gray hair. She saw me across the aisle and smiled and she just came up to me and she just, she just touched my hand and she just said, well done, well done. And that for me was just like, she understood what, what I was doing. She said, she was saying, you, you know, you're doing the right thing, you know, even though it's been taboo in our community and we don't talk about it and, you know, we just hide it and hush it up. She was saying, well done to you, you know, you know it's, it, it's important. And on, on, on top of that, the number of people who have told me that they, uh, that in the same, it was actually in the same supermarket, that um, uh, she'd shown the film to a group of young kids, all at-risk kids, you know, who, who have, you know, the, you know, they're one step away from prison. Some of these, some of these kids, all some of them on gangs, and when she put the film on, she said you could hear a pin drop. And, you know, they saw this, you know, that, well, she said, one guy said, I recognize that guy from TV. And when, when I started talking about psychosis, they were glued to it and they got it completely. And um, she said they all watched it. And at the end of it, it was a real lively discussion about smoking weed, about, about you know, kind of about, about the, the need to sort of watch your thoughts and be careful. and. And their behaviour, and, and and again, if you know, as I said, I've had no shame. I've got no shame in what I in what I did. I think it was. I think um, it's a, a positive thing what I did, even though I, even though it put me in a, a very vulnerable position for a while. Uh, I just feel glad that this whole thing has sparked a conversation. Mm. Positive. And and I think there are many many people who are also glad of, of the conversation that, that this has sparked. It's, it's interesting that um, when you were talking, one of the things that uh, I, I was thinking about, uh, particularly when you're talking about those young people that you met in, in the course of making the documentary and, and the young people who, uh, for whom the documentary was shown, I think there's something interesting about kind of meeting people where they are and, and, and trying to, um, I guess, give, give space or, or give voice or give time to people. And it, I guess what that comes back to, and, and Kojo, maybe you can comment on this. So you spoke a bit about the work and, and how kind of being part of the involvement team and the involvement register changed things for you. And that was a turning point. May I ask, so what did it kind of feel like for you to kind of have that, that, that space for your voice to be positioned in a, in a different place to what it was prior to, to, to that? I think, um how it felt was empowering. I think that's the key word. Mm. Um, a lot of stigma. When you go through mental health, people can see you as less a lesser version of who you were before you experienced that. So sometimes people can subconsciously disempower you or tell you that this is too much for you or, you know, maybe you've got to take it easy, but... Um, being a part of the involvement team was like me coming as I am mm. and um, looking at 
the concept of post traumatic growth looking at how can I grow out of my situation how can I change and help others so it was refreshing because spending years in seclusion can be very disheartening it can be it can be very despairing but when you're in a position of change and you have a voice and you're able to speak to the right people who need that message it's very rewarding as well Mm -hmm. and um even though like I have a degree and a master's and I could pursue certain higher paying job roles I just find that there's real wealth in passion there's real wealth in morals and and values and these things are very enriching for the soul so I I find it that it's a blessing to be in the position that I'm in now and uh it, it's it's been a journey mm-hmm. I just just drop in there you've got a degree and a master's yeah yeah I have a degree and a master's see that makes me I look at there I just think I, you know I just think you know I'm, I'm blown away, but you know, that, that somebody as bright, intelligent uh, uh, as you, uh, w- the system would criminalize and you, would, you could find yourself being denied mental health help uh, uh, and end up uh, uh, arrested and, and imprisoned. Is that, is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, that's what happened, yeah. Just mind blown. Purely, purely off of stereotype and it's like, uh, it's a shame, it's a shame, the profiling that goes on. I mean, when I was approached by eight or nine police, they were accusing me of having a weapon. And whilst me saying that I didn't have anything like that on me, I was tasered twice and I was, just, and I was attacked. And in defending myself, I was charged for defending myself. And I ended up in prison, in a, in a very high cap prison. So, um, yeah, I mean, now I'm, I'm trying to reverse that stereotype. Mm. And say, you know, it's not about what is on my outer, but it's what is on my inner. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to let that inner, inner side of me show. So, you know, I try to use my skills in a positive way and uh, apply it to mental health. So my, my master's was in design for digital media and I'm currently working on a website and uh a concept called cultural therapy so even though I'm not working in that profession anymore I still want to apply myself and use it to help others so um yeah this project is, is still a baby project but it's all looking about it's all about looking at mental health holistically mm. trying to challenge the stigmas within the black community you know sometimes mental health can be seen as a spiritual thing Mm-hmm. It can be seen as uh, it's to do with substance abuse and stuff like that. But the same way that there's a negative, I believe in polarity, there's always a positive. Mm-hmm. So I believe that there are substances that you can, you can take, like having a healthier diet, for instance, can help remove brain fog and limit the ability for mental health to creep into your life. So I'm looking at how can culture be therapeutic Mm. so um there's a lot there's a lot going on and especially with the youth there's a lot of undiagnosed trauma um what i went through uh when i was younger um was to do with bereavement through violence stabbings shootings and these are all issues that are rampant in the black community and uh it's, it's something very difficult to battle. Mm. But like Dave, David says, you know, when you throw racism into the mix, it's just a different, different concoction to digest. It's difficult. It's like, you know, you're dealing with one enemy and you've got another enemy mm. attacking you. And it's, it's, it's an unfair battle. It's a two against one battle. More than two, the, the issues that we have to face you know, and it being Black History Month, you know, I think this is a timely time to be discussing, you know, mental health in the Black community. Definitely. And 
listening to you speak, Koja, and to you speak, David, one of the things that is kind of reverberating around my head is this is this notion of, of kind of uh, cultural competence. So it, it there is a reason why um, black men are overrepresented represented in kind of being detained under the Mental Health Act, being treated in, in restrictive ways. There is a reason why um, why sort of outcomes are, are, are kind of poorer. There are health inequalities that exist. And then one of the things that I sort of come back to is, is asking this question of, are we working in a way, or are we, as a, as a mental health professional, am I working in a way, are my colleagues working in a way that um, has or takes that, that notion of come as you are and, and tries to understand not just what's presenting in front of me, but kind of what, what journey has the person taken in, in the time they've got here? How have, they, how have they turned up today? What's happened in their life? What's happened in their family's lives? And, and I think it, until we're able to, to, to kind of recognize that, we're gonna keep kind of going through this, this, this cycle of, of, um, of misunderstanding and misaligning stereotypes to people. It'll be interesting to, to hear from, from yourself, David, in terms of that sort of, I guess, building a culturally competent future or kind of, yeah, doing something different and recognizing that these are peop people first. How do you think, or, or kind of, have you come across any, any ways that um, we might be able to sort of achieve that or, or way in which we might be able to to, to kind of implement that for future generations? I think, uh, you know, we may have touched upon this earlier on um, in, in, a, in a side conversation in, in that, you know, when I um, was sectioned, uh, I didn't see any, any black staff and I didn't see any other black patients. I was sort of alone on that ward. Um, and as I said, over-medicated, I was given four times, four times the legal limit of sedatives. And that, that is purely to control me. Mm. That is purely to keep me pliant. That is purely because perhaps the staff were afraid of a large, black man and um, you know you talk about uh, cultural specificity in, in that sense you, you know had there been uh, senior nurses of color on the wards at that time that they might have been able to uh, uh, take care of me in a maybe slightly different way you know uh, you know I, I if there was perhaps more diversity on the staff, then they might not have they might not have made those decisions, um, and, and not not just even on staff, but I mean, I say at a senior level, uh, able to uh, impose um, to assist to 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 break down those you know, those cultural uh, that cultural miscommunication, um, you know things might might have been might have been different, but as I said, mine was 30 years ago, but it, Kojo, were there any black members of staff uh, in, in, your, with your, in your experience? Yeah, in my experience, um, there were a number of black staff, but what I noticed was, is that the majority of them were in lower positions where they had less, of, less say and I can I can empathize with some of them. I really do. Spending time on the ward, you know, I, I bonded with quite a few nurses, and we spoke. And um, was that so, was that was it soothing to speak to a, 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 a person of color? Yeah, it was. It was, but it was also kind of disheartening because even though the people who were treating me. Uh, looked like me they were in a position where they too were in a in a form of bondage in a sense that they were not able to bring their full selves to work mm -hmm. and they're not allowed to speak out of turn 
and the people higher up of um, which is something that needs to change the people of power were majority white and I can see the racism still have a play in their lives in the sense of you know they they can be dismissed for speaking out of turn and trying to do certain things that they might feel is the solution mm -hmm. so I think culturally um there was a potential and there was huge potential for that cultural bonding to happen however the overseers who are not of the same race and not of the same culture need to become allies mm -hmm. as opposed to um hindrances and blockages towards cultural things so just things like having your own cultural food the nurses understood that, you know, I would like to have this cultural food and they themselves have this in their private life, but I may not be allowed on the ward for yeah. whatever reason, maybe due to packaging or licensing or whatever. So there were loads of things that I wanted to have uh, that would have maybe benefited me because diet is very important to your mental health, that many nurses wanted to advocate for me for to have but their hands were tied completely because there's always somebody higher up who needs to give the green light and i think it's changed a lot and it's probably changed a lot from your time but there's still a long way to go so that's why things like involvement uh is key because you get uh people going onto the wards and and listening to the patients as pefs or uh patient engagement facilitators where they're listening what's happening on the ground and what needs to change and that's all work that is happening in the involvement team but i think it's going to take a long time before things change completely but yeah. Um, yeah it was it was it was kind of you know also traumatic because they when i say they i'm talking about the nurses of color they were the ones that were usually restraining me and putting me into seclusion. And it, it kind of it kind of felt like uh, almost like they were given the harder job, mm. the jobs that required less compassion. Oh. Yeah, that's what I felt like. But um, going into the ward rounds, I'm speaking to somebody of a different culture. So the doctor would not be my culture. So when I'm trying to advocate for my well-being, there's always that cultural competency that needs to be there that isn't always there. Mm. That's where I think uh, the change needs to happen. But um, I cannot imagine going to a ward and nowadays and being the only black person there because it's completely skewed. It's mm. like one in four time you're four times more likely to be secluded and placed on a mental health ward as a black man so when i went onto the wards i was seeing a lot of black patients a lot of black and a lot of colored patients and it was it was it wasn't proportional i don't mm. it would be in outside of london but there was a misrepresentation of color mm. and it's it's now it's now concerning and you know, it's, it's, yeah, it really is concerning because there's a lot of gang crime now, a lot of bereavement, a lot of shooting, a lot of stabbing, a lot of drug misuse. And all of these things I think are, are, are impacting, impacting mm. a specific culture within society. Mm. And I think that um, these things need to be addressed. I don't think that it's a coincidence. I think that it's all a, all indirect byproducts of racism mm. to be honest you know through race you get housed in certain areas that are not beneficial for you you you're likely to end up in poverty because mm -hmm. opportunities are not equally distributed and stuff like that so i hope i'm not ranting too much but yeah i think things have changed a little bit from your time with regards to color representation on the ward Mm. but um i don't think anything has changed much when it comes to color representation in high places of high influence hierarchy yeah yeah hierarchy yeah
you make a, a really valid and, and poignant point there, Kaja, and it's something that I've reflected on in my own career. So I've been a healthcare professional for about 11 years now. I, I just over half of that time, I've been, I've been nursing. And actually, for so much of that time, I questioned whether I felt able to or was allowed to bring my authentic self to that role to bring aspects of my understanding as a black male growing up in Britain of Ghanaian parents, to bring that to, 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 um, to work and, and to not kind of have to split those two aspects of, 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 of me, basically. And, um, and I think until we're maybe, until we're uh, allowing people that space to bring their authentic self, we were talking about it, Kojo, to bring that source, like, to, bring, to bring the thing, the vibrancy, that richness, that diversity, we're not going to be, yeah, we're not going to be working with people in a way that, that sees them for who they are, as opposed to just a, a kind of collection of, of symptoms or a risk assessment or something like that. And I think a lot of the onus sits on us as as the, the, the kind of as the profession so it's not my quote but I loved it when I heard it that kind of nurses we're the the kind of cement between the bricks particularly mental health nurses we hold a lot of these things together and, and collectively I think there's a space hopefully for us to to kind of have a voice to to draw a line in the sand and say that there are solutions out there there are ways in which we can do different but it's about having that kind of authority to 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 do so um I, I think uh yeah it's what what's wonderful um it, it is that despite there being a lot to do we're in a place or position where we can we can kind of have or start having these conversations and and start kind of talking about that that elephant in the room, which is pervasive throughout all of this, and, and, and that is racism. Um, I think we've got a, a couple of minutes before I hand back over to, to uh, Catherine Gamble to introduce the, the Q&A. So I wanted to say, uh, again, how much of a privilege it is to, to kind of share this space with both of you. And just to invite, I don't know if you had any kind of final thoughts or anything that you wanted to, to end on. Either David or Kojo. Um, I, I, I'm. I feel really privileged to be uh, speaking to so many uh, wonderful practitioners who work in in a field that is difficult. Um, uh, that, that that a lot of people maybe couldn't ever imagine themselves uh, doing, but you, you're all absolute legends and heroes and um um it's just wonderful to 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 know that you know it, th that uh i i feel a part of this conversation and uh, i i feel not just a part of it but i feel as though i'm part of i'm now also part of a a great community of people who are seeking to change uh the, the status quo and uh, and, and really sort of bring equality where it, it, into a field where perhaps uh, before um, you know there wasn't there wasn't there wasn't as much so I just feel privileged to be uh, amongst you people tonight and that I'm feel blessed to 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 to, to be a part of this yeah, I think I would say the same I think it's it's an honor to be in a position where you can use your voice to impact others, to create a positive domino effect. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of the solution and not the problem anymore. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an honour to be a part of the team and also to be able to speak to the people who can make a change. Mm. Sometimes getting access to those people um, as a service user or as a as somebody with lived experience sometimes you're not in the room when the decisions are being made and now um, through the involvement team that is now beginning to change in the sense that I'm now going to be in the room when decisions are being made and I can contribute and speak to the right person because there's no point in me becoming negative sour or venting to other people who have no power 
So I think um, to empower people, I need to be in that room. And um, I've, I'm, I'm thankful there was a seat for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kaiser and David, thank you both so much. And I, I salute you both. And I'll hand over to Catherine now. <laughs> <laughs> significant amount of saluting is going on what a privilege to hear both of you um and i think uh, to quote you david i think you've shaken the bullshit out of a lot of us all three of you um so i think it's a very powerful message and i know that um a lot of us will be thinking of that image as well of you hacking away on the undergrowth uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Bertha Matunge, and I'm an assistant director of nursing at Central and Northwest London NHS Foundation Trust. I'm here tonight as a member of the RCN Mental Health Forum Ethnic Minority Subgroup. And I just want to say, wow, thank you so much, David, Kojo, and Simon for this powerful discussion. I think I speak for everybody on this call that uh, it, it just it just it's just so raw and touching and wow I'm I'm really blown away. So uh, I've now got some questions uh, from some of the members of the RCN, and I'll start off by um, paraphrasing from two questions that were raised by Carol Webley Brown, RCN council member, and Terence Khan, an allied health professional. And I think both yourself, uh, David and Kojo, you've already made reference around the stigma that's still there out uh, across society. And it's really inspiring just hearing your stories and what a difference you are making in kind of uh, addressing this stigma, like you were describing, David, how people are coming up and talking to you. Now, uh, the first question from these two is, what do you think would be helpful for black men to access mental health services and overcome the stigma? What do you think as mental health professionals, what could we do? What would be helpful to kind of address this stigma? Kojo, I'll start with you. I'll start with you, David. Oh, well, I was going to say, Kojo. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry about that. No, well, it's 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 only it's only as I say because um, I I mine mine was uh, you know my experience was thirty years ago, um, and I, I know even at the time, I was just I was just afraid to 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 to, to go and see a doctor. Um, um, and actually, when I did go and see him, it was I was pretty much dismissed. Uh, and my, my con the concerns of my friends were, were dismissed in the most sort of card and um, sort of discriminatory way. Um, so, so I, so I, so I guess perhaps there has to be more uh, community outreach. There has to be much more. You know, that there, there has to be perhaps we need to start engaging with the community more um, you know i was perhaps seeing i was seeing a, a program just the other night um ashley banjo's program you know where, where he was talking about his experiences after they um made that uh, that, that dance you know how the police in certain communities are now uh, you know go you know they're Trying to engage with the young, with the youth. Maybe it's just playing football, but you know whether it's trying to get some sort of community outreach. And it, it, they, they might be, uh, uh, it, it might just be playing a game of football. But you know, if we can, if if, if that changes one or two young lads, mm. or, or or inspires one or two young lads, if that breaks down that barrier, that barrier of mistrust, if it just saves one or two, that's just that's that's useful. And I think perhaps maybe. Maybe if, you know if there's more black outreach to uh, in, in some of these uh, communities, just to uh, 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 at least have a conversation uh, uh, about uh, about how they're feeling. Uh, do they want to talk? Just offering them some sort of service that that you know that that allows them uh, to 
to unburden and to discuss, mm. uh, it, it, you know, just their day-to-day -day life uh, uh, um, might, 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 be, might be something we could try. You know, to, again, to break that, break the, uh, the, the fear of, of entering the system uh, or, 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 you know, I, I think would be a good thing so that people feel they can talk, they can unburden, uh, and, you know, if, if we can offer them a service where they can talk to a professional, I think that might be a good thing. Mm, thank you about with that. And Kojo, I think for you, you, you actively sought out help. You said about eight times yeah. and still you were not receiving it. So yeah. what about for those who are kind of like worried, they still have this stigma, they don't want to go and say, look, I need help. How can us as professionals help breaking down that barrier? I think um, one of the key things that is an issue in accessing mental health today in a crisis, I would say, is that I don't, I don't believe that a general a and &E is the right environment for somebody to go to because they're, they're, they're highly strung. Every, the nurses are stressed already. They've got people dealing with literal blood whatever it is that they're dealing with. And sometimes you coming in with mental health can be an annoyance to them. There's not a patience mm. there. And uh, I think that it needs, to, we need to have contact centers that are for mental health alone so that the people who are receiving you are trained to receive you, especially the security. Mm. A lot of security is trained to just restrain and to um, suppress people but if they were given mental health training maybe they'll be able to, to decipher at an earlier stage that this person is not just being erratic because they have criminal intent but they're going through a crisis and they need help so I'm happy to know that you know this trust that I'm working in they've opened a, a ward that is specifically for people with mental health coming in and they can be assessed. And that environment I think is safer than a general A&E where you've got security, you are not used to uh, certain people with mental health. And what tends to happen is conflicts, things escalate. They're not trained to de-escalate. It seems like they call the police very easily. And that causes a lot of difficulty and, fr and friction. So I think, in a bullet point, that would be one thing. Another thing would be to have people with lived experience at that early stage there to support so that they're there with the team, you know, to advise. People with lived experience need to have a say in restrictive practices mm -hmm. and to be able to say, you know, I don't think this is right. This, maybe this approach would be better or more empathetic or more caring. So I think those would be my two points. Thank you for that. And I think uh, the, the three of you, I heard you all discussing and making reference to cultural competence. Now, uh, this is for you, Simon. I know you have some affiliations with uh, universities where nurses do training. What, what do you think could be done around the nursing curriculum to ensure that nurses are completing their nurse training with a degree of cultural competence? I think it's kind of, so for, for those of us who are educators, I think part of the onus sits with us in terms of how we interpret the, the kind of standards with which we, we educate the new nurses or the future nurses. So um, are we kind of, when we think about things like uh, simulation or we're giving people examples, are we basing those examples within the communities and the kind of nuances and the complexities that people are going to be experiencing once they're qualified? Or are we just kind of presenting this one sort of homogenous patient that fits within um, the, the kind of boxes that we tend to create in, in healthcare? Um, and then in addition to that, I think it's creating those spaces for I don't want to say, well, maybe it is for, for, for future nurses to be agitators, to question things, to challenge that status quo. Because we've talked about 
um, the, the the kind of maybe the inability sometimes or, or, or kind of the constriction that comes with being a junior nurse and not being able to kind of speak out. And if we can, um, if we can train people and if we can make it the norm that it's part of your role to advocate for the people you're working for or you're working with, then I think that goes a long way to achieving that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, all three of you. The next question comes from John Crowley from Greenwich University. And he asks, what mental health nursing intervention or skills did David and Kojo find most beneficial to their care? And I think maybe for this question, I'd also say, is there like a particular member, a, a particular nurse who cared for you, who left a, a lasting impression? And wh what was it about their skills? I don't know who wants to go first. I, I mean, I, I can't um, say, you know, I, 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 I've got to be honest, you know, I, I, the, the, the care I received wasn't great. But um, my mother, my mother was my mother was by just showing love, and support, and compassion, and patience, and care. Uh, uh, she watched me like a hawk, and uh, and I, I think if if there is if there is a, a lesson that I would I, I would say to any mental health professional is is to uh, is to is to offer your your you know if you can offer that rather than being dismissive because what happened to me with, you know in my experience to offer genuine care and compassion to you know the person that you're treating just goes a hell of a long way and um, in, from what I've seen at the early intervention center through my documentary all all of the staff there just so attentive to the to the children. Uh, listening and um, and being g as genuine advocates, and I know, you know, when you are in that disturbed state, that just means so much. If someone just takes the time to listen and 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 uh, to, to to offer genuine genuine compassion, uh, it, when you're in that heightened state, it, it can it can really really mean make the world a difference. Thank you, thank you for that. And I hope we, I hope, like you say, the early intervention staff showed a care that you would want to receive. So I hope we've come a long way from when you were on the wards. I don't know, Kojo, to you. Um, I would say that uh, definitely David has covered a lot of what I would have said with regards to compassion. Um, compassion and empathy I think these are skills that are needed um, sometimes on the ward nurses can be caught up in reaching KPIs and focusing only on medication and focusing heavily on paperwork and sometimes that detaches that bonding time that they could give um, but I did I did find some nurses really take time out to listen to my story and that was good for me because I was able to vent and get things off of my chest. Because one thing that I didn't really experience much during my mental health journey was talking therapy. And sometimes nurses are in the position to talk to you because they're on the ground. The psychologist or the, uh, the responsible clinician, you only see them maybe bi-weekly for 15 minutes. They don't really know you. They haven't spoken to you. Um, all they deal with is notes and I feel like nurses who document notes need to make sure that they're corroborating their notes genuinely by getting to know the person that they're speaking about and I think that um, conversation is therapeutic listening and being heard is, is, is therapeutic even if it's not the most positive of discussions just getting it off of your chest and having someone to speak to because when you're on the ward you're not with your family mm -hmm. sometimes you know it would be nice to have people emulate that around you and be caring in a sense 
treating you like family you know i'm not saying that they need to adopt the person but treat them like how you would want your child or your nephew or your niece to be treated and i think once that happens that reciprocity will will create a healing so i think yeah just having those qualities that david mentioned compassion care you know just like what he mentioned about having his mother um i think that yeah people need to take that maternal approach and that Thanks. maybe can be put into the training or whatever but yeah thank you for that and I, and i think on the call we have a wide spectrum of professionals from university lecturers to nurses on the front line so i think everybody's taking that on board the third question it kind of overlaps with uh, the sec the second question as well and this comes from a member of the networks but there's no name and they say, what role do you think the wider nursing workforce must play in improving the Black men's experience of health services? So I don't know who would like to go. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at that. So um, <laughs> essentially, as the nursing workforce, we make up the large proportion of, of professionals in the healthcare system. So based on that, we potentially have the largest voice um, or potentially the loudest voice, so if you think about it like that. So I think it's important for us um, as, a, as a wider workforce to, to use that collective voice in a way that kind of brings issues like that to light. It, 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 we use that platform that we have. Maybe we, we, as a profession, haven't taken it up as, as much as we can do. And I think we, we can do more in, in that respect, but we use that position to, um, to hold people to account, to, to hold ourselves to account, to ask ourselves, what is it that we need to be doing differently? Because if, if kind of um, better understanding and, and sort of good practice can, can sort of permeate across the healthcare system and, and kind of move around in, a, in an organic way. I believe that we'll see um, kind of changes in care. We'll see see benefits. So we, we've spoken a bit about um, stigma, and 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 for right the right reasons that the mistrust that exists for Black, Asian, and, and minority ethnic people when entering the mental health care system. And I think we as as nurses as there's a unique strength, as I said, in, in particularly uh, mental health nurses, I'm a bit biased, but kind of getting alongside somebody to, to, to kind of share that common space. And once you're able to, to kind of share that space, it doesn't become about, I'm a, I'm a practitioner, you're a patient. It's we're both people first. We then start to think about what makes us the same, kind of what fears do we have that are the same? Um, how do we, Kind of move away from 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 positions or this is my position to thinking about what are our common interests and i think we as a nursing profession have the the, the numbers the voice and 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 the power to do so to, to kind of role model that for for the rest of the healthcare system okay. i think i'd also just quickly add um you, you know I, I, and this is something i heard the other week is championing uh, nurses of color for higher positions. Um, yeah. Because I think, I think, you know, uh, in, in, you know, it's, you know, nurses of color, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, they make up a large number of the workforce, but unfortunately, in terms of uh, manage, management roles and supervised roles, perhaps that's that their numbers maybe aren't quite as prolific and, and uh, I think they need to be championed and they need to they need to be uh, um, uh, supported uh, uh, to, to, to sort of to sort of rise up the ladder so that so that so that they can uh, uh, speak so that people can speak out people can uh, advocate for different working practices and, and not not face retribution when they uh, when they um, when they do speak out on certain matters. Mm, that's very true. 
very, very true. Thank you, David. And Kojo? Um, I would say that uh, a role that nurses could, could take on that would help is not only for them to get into higher positions, but for them to become advocates. And this goes for people from all race, all races. Um, white people can advocate for black issues. Um, they can be allies. And I know that there are ally training programs out there. <coughs> but um, what I would say is, is that uh, not to be silent, to advocate on behalf of, 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 of and also for them to, to not be fearful um, when racism is taking place and they can see that it's taking place, for them not to feel that their hands are tied, for them to open up and speak on behalf of patients, even if they fear that they may be jeopardizing their role. Because I think a lot of people fear more for their mortgages and than they do fear for the well-being of some of the people. And sometimes uh, that can be an issue. So I think more nurses advocating for patients when racism and stigma is, is concerned needs to take place. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I think it was incredibly powerful Kojo, when you were kind of describing your experience that um, the majority of nurses on your ward were black, but there were no senior nurses who were black and who were in a position to influence the quality of care that you, you were receiving. And I think the beauty of this platform is that I know we've got a lot of senior leaders across the NHS who are on the platform and these conversations everyone is aware of it, the disparities in leadership. I might be a senior nurse, but I'm in the minority. Mm -hmm. And I see it, I go on the wards and most of the staff are black. But when I'm in meetings for my role, I'm maybe the only one there. So this is a piece of work that is the RCN Forum, the ethnic minority subgroup. We are really passionate about driving because the, the black nurses are equally as passionate and equally as skilled or as the, uh, the, the, the other nurses as well. So it's important that we collectively, because I know every single nurse, in spite of what their background is, is passionate to provide good quality care. So we need to advocate for that disparity in leadership to be addressed. So thank you, both of you. You articulated it really well. And I'm challenging all the senior leaders who are on this call that you're hearing it from somebody who actually experienced how having a lack of black senior nurses can impact their care. So the final question from uh, the networks, uh, it says, what advice would you give family, friends and parents about how to support someone with psychosis? I know, David, you already made reference to your mom, but would like to hear from you again. So I don't know who's going to go first, Kojo or David. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say that uh, for friends and family to look at mental health illness as any other illness, whether it's... Uh, a physical illness, you know, you treat it with compassion and care. You know, you, you're, 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 you're concerned for the other person genuinely. But I feel like with mental health, it's seen not so much as an illness, but more like a, a taboo. It's seen as something that you know is is not <sighs> deserving of empathy maybe because they cannot imagine or or put themselves in the shoes and that's why I think my advice to friends and family is uh, be empathetic put yourself in that person's shoes and try to to look at the illness as purely an illness and nothing less you know it's not a spiritual uh, issue it's not well not in isolation should I say look at it holistically Mm. look at it holistically mental health is something that uh 
is very broad and very complex. So try not to isolate your, your viewpoint on, on mental health. You know, your physical health can affect your mental health. You know, it's, 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 it's all connected. So I think my advice to friends and family is don't disconnect mental health like you would for any other illness. Look at it connected. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, I, I, I would say, I echo that. Love, compassion, patience, um, time, care. And it's a difficult experience to go through. And it's painful to watch a loved one uh, go, go through a psychotic experience. It's, it's uh, frightening. Mm. It's, um, you don't understand it, it's frustrating. But as much love and compassion you can show them, mm. care you can give them, uh, it, 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 you know, the, the, the more the more the better because they'll need your support. Um, I'll need your support because when it gets, uh, if if left unattended and you know the delusions and the hallucinations begin, it's a scary place. You know, I'm speaking from experience. It was a very very scary place to to to, to be in, and um, as I say, without my mother's love, uh, I, I don't really know what would have happened to me. She, you know, so so I. I urge you to show, show your family member love and compassion because they'll, they'll need it. Thank you. Thank you. One Thank you. Thing. Oh, sorry, Kojo, did you want to come uh, in? Uh, I was going to say just one more thing is um, yeah. it's like what uh, David said about it being scary is to also look after your own mental health um, because sometimes, you know, you're, you, can you can develop anxieties just mm. out of what somebody else is going through so mm. you can become depressed based upon what somebody else is going through so also you know look after your mental health and look out for the triggers mm. definitely definitely and I think one thing I always say to nurses that I work with is when you are dealing with family and carers uh, of loved ones who are unwell we need to understand that they are in a scary place as well. And mm. they need that patience, compassion, because sometimes they are just scared. That's why they, they will be asking and asking for more information. Mm. And it's just about listening and being supportive. Uh, before we round up, Simon, is there anything you want to say in regards to this? Um, no, I, I, I don't think I can add anything. I think you both David and, and Kojo have sort of beautifully summarised, I think, what, mm. yeah, we, we need to consider going forward. So. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, the three of you. And I'll hand back to Catherine now. Thank you, Bertha, and thank you for your honesty in answering those questions. I, um, I know that um, uh, we've got Anne and uh, um, uh, Stephen just wanting to sum up about and to just talk to you about the, 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 the plans to go from here, uh, because we've just had some wonderful suggestions that all three of you have made. Um, but I know that Simon, um, Stephen and uh, Anne are going to just have a summary. Uh, I know we're a bit running on, so I hope people don't mind. I know we've been slightly over, might run over from eight. But do you want to say, um, Anne, just what, what happens next? Okay, I'll, I'll pop in first. Mm -hmm. um, so hello everybody, uh, I, I think just like as Bertha opened, uh, opened her thing, the first thing that came in the head was wow. Um, it's been an incredible evening, uh, I have to say. I've, I've been really excited for this event, it's come around very quickly. Um, and I have been watching the participant, uh, the visitors list as people come and join. And I saw that it hit 570 attendees at one point. Um, so now that everyone, everyone has, has delivered their, uh, their, their discussion, you can see, uh, yeah, you don't have to be nervous, but yes, it was uh, fantastically attended. And um, yeah, so I'm, what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, um, so I'm just, just kind of give a bit of a background about where we are now. Um, and the direction we're planning to take. Um, and I'll bring in my, my colleague, Anne, uh, Anne Mitchell, 
um, just to, to take forward uh, take forward the final part. Um, so yeah, so earlier this year, uh, I had the privilege of leading the RCN's response to the consultation on reforming the Mental Health Act. Um, and although the consultation did not ask specific questions around the impact of the proposed reforms uh, on people from ethnic minority backgrounds, uh, the RCN and our members, all members from all, all different backgrounds, were very keen to ensure our concerns were included in our response. And just to kind of highlight some of the, the issues, issues that we, we focused on. So clearly we, we found firstly in, in the final report of the independent review, um, highlighted ethnic minority groups are at greater risk of compulsory, compulsory detention uh, than white majority groups. And black people in particular are four times more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act. I think we've, we've touched on that two or three times already today. So serious, serious numbers to be mindful of. Um, RCN members, so nurses, midwives, and healthcare support workers believe that this disparity is due to systemic and institutional forms of racism. And again, that example that's being picked up is, is around that stereotypical view of uh, black men being perceived as dangerous and violent when mentally ill. As Ricardo's experience, many black men find their first interaction with mental health services via the police during a crisis when at their most vulnerable. As Simon, David and Kojo discussed earlier, culturally sensitive care is necessary when caring for individuals from diverse backgrounds with a range of traditions, languages, faiths, uh, and cultural norms around mental wellness and ill health. It's important for mental health services to avoid that one size fits all approach and develop a system that shows respect for different cultures. So RCM members have and continue to call for high quality evidence-based training on human rights and equality issues in the context of the Mental Health Act for all health and care staff who provide support to people with mental health problems. We believe that that training must include the impact of systemic institutional and interpersonal forms of racism and discrimination. Any training must also incorporate how to demonstrably identify and tackle all forms of bias that impact on the delivery of services, as well as the outcomes and experiences of patients and carers. It's imperative that the nursing workforce is representative of the people we care for. As Kojo eloquently outlined earlier, that this must be at every level and in every layer. Achieving such a name will help turn the tide in terms of creating inclusive and responsive organizational culture for all. As Simon touched on, I too see the incredible opportunity now to make a real change. And on, on another note this evening, we'll also mark the official launch of the RCM Mental Health Forum's Ethnic Minority Subgroup. And on that note, uh, to tell you a bit more, I'm just going to hand you over to Dr. Anne Mitchell. Um, Dr. Anne Mitchell is a Mental Health Forum, is a Mental Health Forum Committee member, and she is chair of the Ethnic Minority Subgroup. Um, Anne, over to you. When you're done, come back to me and I'll just give a final closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Stephen. And good, e good evening again to everyone. And um, I have to say I've been inspired, um, privileged, and I'm trying to think of some other words that, um, and based on what I've learned or heard today. So thank you, David, and thank you, Kojo, so very much. And Bertha, thank you, and nice to have you on board with the forum. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit now about the forum and what we're planning to do. And this is a great big thank you to Stephen actually for moving this forward. Um, I, I welcome this opportunity as chair to launch the Mental Health Forum Committee, uh, ethnic minority subgroup. The purpose of this subgroup is to bring about change in the way we perceive the delivery of mental health care within diverse cultural groups. Our aim is to encourage more equality in terms of promotion and training within the mental health settings for minority staff, in addition to recognize that healthcare practitioners do not necessarily need to be knowledgeable about all cultures, but their approach should be one of openness, compassion, respect, and a willingness to listen and learn about the culture of the person they're caring for. 
with this new forum, we will seek to do this by working collaboratively as a UK-wide team with trust and other esteemed institutions to bring about change for ethnic minority staff members and patients admitted to mental health settings. I feel the RCN is ideally placed to host this group because of its mission and drive for equality among its nurses and improvement in care and practice. The philosophy driving this focus is one of humility and sensitivity. I'm not looking for answers immediately because we feel it's important for all to recognize, and we've heard this word a lot tonight, that culturally sensitive and tailored care is vital when caring for individuals from diverse backgrounds, as these have a range of traditions, language faiths, cultural norms around mental wellness and ill health that differ from the majority perception. All health professionals, regardless of their ethnicity, have long held beliefs and practices. However, these require careful navigation to build trust with all those we are caring for. This conversation is not new, as we've heard tonight, and it has been going on for many years, based on what David has said, and now Kojo. So it's been developing over a period based on stories of racism, discriminatory practices, and inequality of opportunity in the workplace, and for those seeking help from the mental health services. Ethnic minority voices have been speaking loudly for years, but not listened to. Now they need to be listened to. I look forward to our inaugural meeting, which is next week, and welcoming members from a variety of backgrounds to take this forward. With their support and help, developing the aims, the objectives, and of course our mission statements, as well as philosophy, will enable this group to have a meaningful impact. Thank you all so very much. And I'll pass you back to Stephen now. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, and yes, we'll move the group a meeting next week. Really looking forward to that, that first meeting. Um, so yeah, ju just to close, I just want to, uh, want to offer my thanks really. Um, so on behalf of the Mental Health Forum and the Royal College of Nursing, David, your journey has given us insight into experiences most of us can only imagine. Sharing your life events the way you have and continue to do will truly influence the narrative of mental health nursing and mental health care. Thank you for being here this evening to share your story. Thank you Secondly, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Secondly to Kojo, thank you for taking the time to join David on stage, shedding light in your experiences over the past several years. Your journey of recovery is truly inspirational. Simon, for your open and honest approach, facilitating tonight's discussion, helping us to better understand the challenges faced by black men when accessing, but also when providing mental health care. Thank you. To Catherine, for initiating this whole event from David's book uh, reading session at South Bank several weeks ago. Um, it was a pleasure to have uh, an esteemed RCN fellow chair this important discussion tonight. To the RCN Libraries team, Francis, Sarah and Anna, and Rob in the AV department for your incredible responsiveness and ability to coordinate this event how you have. And David's team, Natalie and Jess, for your ability to shape and deliver all of this engagement in such a short space of time. To all other members of the organizing group, thank you for supporting the planning and delivery of this event, uh, particularly to you, Bertha, uh, for putting your, our members' questions to the panel, and to Anne for your inspirational launch of the new ethnic minority subgroup. Lastly, thank you to everyone joining us this evening at this virtual event. Uh, I hope this evening's discussion has inspired you as much as it has inspired me. Only by sharing our stories and working together can real change happen. And on that note, I would like to end this event by sharing an oft quoted ancient African proverb. If you want to go fast, walk alone.
If you want to go far, walk together. Thank you very, very much. And good night. Thank good you. night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.